let's make a start. So we are in Shmuel Aleph, and we are in the uh, second chapter, the prayer of Hannah. Um, let's share the screen uh, with the sh- chapter. There we are. Hopefully you can see that, yeah? You see yeah. the chapter? Yeah. Okay, good. Right, yes. now, just a, uh, let me, um, let me, uh, <coughs> I think we just need to mute you all. I forgot to do that. There we go. You're all muted. Leon, if you could unmute, that would be helpful. There we go. There's a screen again. Right. So a little follow up from uh, last week. Um, We had a little discussion about the first uh, Pasuk. Rama Karni Bashem. My horn has been raised by Hashem. And um, if we skip to um, the, the last verse of the song, verse 10, we'll see Vayaram Keren Mishicho. Uh, and the horn of the anointed one will be raised. Um, and I, I, we had a little bit of discussion about what this horn was. Um, and I had a uh, afterwards um, one of the uh, people who's not actually uh, in the Shia live, but listens to it uh, afterwards, Dr. Dov Lister, who's an old friend of mine, lives in Ranana now. Um, he sent me a WhatsApp saying, um, listen to the beginning of your Shia. I think that probably means he only listened to the beginning and probably didn't bother listening to the rest. But anyway, he says, listen to the beginning of your shi'or. There's an English expression, raising the horn of praise and also raising the horn of anointment. Actually, he wrote raising the horn of an ointment, but I think he means anointment. Um, The horn or the shofar was filled with oil from which the highest echelons, e.g. kings, were anointed. Hence, as you say, it's about raising people up into high offices. So that's, I think somebody might have mentioned that last week as well, but uh, this raising the horn, apparently when you uh, anoint the king or or you anoint the coin gadol, probably, same idea, um, you fill a a shofar or a horn with the uh, oil of anointment, uh, and it's raised up over his head and poured on his head. Uh, and that's so therefore this expression, my horn has been raised, uh, fits in with all the things that we've said earlier on, which is that uh, <coughs> Hannah, who was uh, feeling down in the dumps uh, and low, uh, is now elevated because uh, she's had her uh, uh, she's had her wish granted uh, and she has uh, given birth to Shmuel. So that was just um, uh, from uh, Karen. And we're going to come back to that idea of anointing and the, the Meshicho, the anointed one. We're going to come back to that later on when we get to verse 10. Um, so um, we, we did verses 1, 2 and 3. So I'd like to start now by reading uh, verses um, 4 to 8 inclusive. Um, which really uh, are um, poetic versions of the same idea, uh, as you will see. Let's read verses four to eight, please. The bow of the mighty is broken, while the foundering are girded with strength. The sated ones are hired out for bread, while the hungry ones cease to be so. While the barren woman bears seven, the one with many children becomes bereft. Hashem brings death and gives life. He lowers to the grave and raises up. Hashem impoverishes and makes rich. He humbles and he elevates. He raises the needy from the dirt, from the trash heaps. He lifts the destitute to seat them with nobles and to endow them with a seat of honor. For Hashem's are the pillars of the earth, and upon them he set the world. Okay, beautifully read as always. Um, The idea here is very clear. It's uh, the fact that 
the world has been turned upside down. The bows of the mighty are broken and those who stumbled are girded with strength. So the mighty ones are no longer mighty. Uh, those who are stumbling are no longer stumbling. They've gained strength. Uh, verse five, uh, those who ha had plenty to eat are now so destitute that they're hiring themselves out for a piece of bread and the hungry have ceased to be hungry. Uh, the same idea. It's, it's a, a turning of uh, the world on its head. The barren woman has born seven and the one that had many children has been bereaved from this passage. We, uh, we uh, learn the, from the Midrash. This is the, the Midrash that we've spoken to about before, where uh, whenever Hannah had a child, Hannah had five children, as we'll see, um, each, uh, on each occasion of the first four, Pene two of Penina's children died. Uh, she cried for Penina at the, at the end. And so the last two of Penina's children who didn't die uh, are, as it were, attributed to uh, Hannah. And that's why she writes, while the barren woman has born seven. Now, that, that's a midrash. Um, it's not specifically uh, um, set out here. And therefore, um, it is uh, allowed to be taken allegorically. And this pasuk could, can be uh, understood to be uh, just uh, poetry by, by saying seven, of course, is the um, is the perfect number. Seven is the uh, is the number which completes everything. We have the seven days of the week. We have seven uh, cycles of the year before Shemitah. We have seven cycles of Shemitah before Yovel. Um, we have uh, seven years to complete the Shast in Daf Hayomi. Um, so seven is a complete number. By the way, um, I worked out yesterday um, in the context um, of Stephen was, uh, uh, was there at the uh, little um, English drosha that we did last yesterday. But I worked it out that Moshe Rabbeinu learned the whole of Torah Shabbat Peh and Torah Shabbat the whole of the oral law in 40 days and 40 nights. Um, it takes Dafayomi seven years to do uh, a full cycle of Shas. And I worked out that at our speed in our Gemara, uh, it would take us 462 years uh, to complete uh, the Shas. So what Moshe Rabbeinu learned in 40 days and 40 nights it would take 462 years to do. I think that puts it into perspective. But anyway, seven is a, uh, a complete number. So I think that here... Uh, Sheva brachot as well. Sheva brachot, yes, thank you. Seven, seven blessings which we uh, have at a wedding. Um, so seven is, is a complete number. Uh, Brit Milah is done on the eighth day because Brit Milah is something which is, no, which is called Me'al Hateva. It's above nature. It's something which is um, hyper-spiritual, if you like. It actually transcends uh, the completeness of this world. Uh, which is why that Brit Mila is done on the eighth day. So uh, this idea that while well, the barren woman has born seven and she that had many children has been bereaved, it's another example of uh, Hannah recognizing that God has the ability to uh, um, transpose uh, people's uh, uh, luck, if you like, people's lives very quickly. It doesn't necessarily have to be taken, uh, the, the Midrash does not have to be taken literally um, uh, if you uh, don't like it, as I actually don't like that midrash. Uh, but uh, uh, the idea that Akadish Baruch Hu can turn things around uh, in a in a moment uh, is what Khanna is uh, pointing out here. Yes, Paul. It just seems a bit of hyperbole here. I mean, yes, she had the, the, the verse about the children might be appropriate, but all the other things and what was happening that the, 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 the whole world has changed. Her world has changed, but how have the whole world changed in that the mighty are broken and all that sort of stuff? It, what else has happened? OK, it's an interesting question. And I think that um, perhaps the answer lies in what um, we spoke about very briefly at the end of last week. Uh, and then David Marks uh, um, pointed out that Hannah is... Uh, counted as one of the seven prophetesses. There's that number seven again. Uh, seven prophetesses uh, in the uh, Tanakh. And um, what the, um, the, the rabbis do here is they attribute this prayer 
to uh, Hana of Hana as uh, as pro as prophecy. So uh, whilst she uh, is raised to the elevated position of being able to have a nevuah, because obviously having a nevuah, having this this uh, idea that Hakadosh Baruch Hu is is uh, uh, speaking through you, which is what a prophet is. Um, you obviously have to have an, a, be on a very high spiritual level. We know, for example, that Yaakov, for the period of uh, uh, 22 years that he was uh, mourning for Joseph, uh, the, as it were, the divine spirit did not rest upon him um, because he was uh, he was in he was in depression, and uh, you can only uh, receive, as it were, the the uh, word of God when you're not in that sort of position, when you're in a, a high position. So I think that what, what, what we see here, and your question actually uh, is, is obviously a very good question. It is hyperbole if you look at Hannah as an individual. What we're seeing here is Hannah using her personal experience of elevation. She feels elated and, uh, uh, and, and elevated, spiritually elevated, by the experience of having her prayer answered, that she reaches the level of nevuah. And there, as we'll see as we go along, there are various bits of this prayer which are, um, uh, are prophecy. And actually there are various bits of this prayer, particularly verse 10, which over the years has caused us no end of grief uh, from the Christians, because the Christians use verse 10 as a, a prophecy for um, obviously the last few words, I'm going to preempt a little bit now, but then we'll come back to it and raise the horn of his anointed one by Yarem Keren Mishicho. Uh, and of course, they uh, um, talk about his anointed one, i.e. God's anointed one being uh, uh, Jesus. So uh, th there's a... Yeah, but that, that's OK for the prophecy in verse 10, because that's in the future. But there are the other things that she's referring to before here are all in the past. But it's not, it's not Nabua, really. Yeah, re remember, but Nabua is not necessarily uh, speaking about the future. Nabua is a high level of uh, um, um, connection with God. For example, Shirat Ayam was talking about things in the past, but that was part, that, was, that would be considered uh, poetry. This is, called, uh, this is called poetry. This is not everything in the Torah is called Shira. This is called a shira, so it's poetry. It's she's she's elevated to the position where she's able to do the nevuah, which you're right is verse ten. Some say also that verse one is also prophecy um, about uh, the, the horn being raised, um, uh, and that's about uh, anointing kings, as we said before, uh, that Shmuel will anoint Shaul and will anoint David. Um, uh, uh, but it, she's elevated into the position of being able to do a shira. So um, you can say that it's nuvua and it's shira as well. So that probably answers your question better, that it's, it's shira. She's inspired. That's the word I was looking for. She's been inspired by her own uh, position um, to, to write uh, uh, some poetry. I, I mean, I, I'm not a poet. I've never written any poetry, uh, but we do have uh, poets in our community, very good poets too. And it would be very interesting to know uh, how they, uh, um, how it is that they come to write their poetry, what it is that inspires them to do so. And I imagine that most people uh, are, who, who write poetry are inspired by personal experiences. And I think that's what's going on here, um, that she is using herself as an example. Uh, and you could argue, and I suppose this is perhaps what you're saying, Paul, you could argue that uh, well, you know, she's a bit, bit arrogant, this really. Uh, she's saying all these wonderful things about God. And so what? She's, she's got her promise uh, fulfilled. Uh, uh, and, uh, but I think, it's, I, think, I think that this is poetry. That's how I read it anyway. Anybody else? got? Yes, David. Yeah. Um, yeah I remember. Should I just take you back to the Shira for a second? Uh, remembering that part, only a small part of the Shira is actually based on the events of Yamsuf. Most of it is future prophecy. Um, and hence, as Yashir Moshe, written in the future tense. Similarly, the other two songs in the Torah are referring mainly to future prophecies, the, the song at the well, and particularly Ha'azinu, 
which is a, a future prophecy of doom before Moshe died. Then coming back to Paul's point of the future prophecy, the two, the two psukim that we just read, I mentioned last week, it's the, the earliest commentary on, on um, Shmuel, which is a Targum Yonatan ben Uziel, refers to it as a prophecy. So he suggests that verse 4, where uh, Chanu is talking about downtrodden, it's a future prophecy about the Chashmonaim, who would be outnumbered and downtrodden and would eventually defeat the, the, the Syrian uh, Greek rulers. And the Pasuk that we're just on now, Pasuk 5, is a prophecy. Uh, the barren widowed people are Yerush people of Yerushalayim at the time of the Roman conquest, but eventually... Um, the, the Roman conquest will be uh, victorious for the Jewish people where the Romans will end up being barren, which of course wouldn't have been known at the time of Yonatan ben Uziel, but we, we know uh, a few hundreds, a few centuries later, the Romans were destroyed. Uh, finally, on this uh, term Shiva, the Redat points out that Shiva uh, in Gematria uh, is the same as Shmuel, and it shouldn't be taken literally as seven, but being a number of children in this case. Okay, so there we can see various different um, uh, prophecies um, which come in these verses. If you have a look at verse four, um, there's also um, some other ideas there um, that we have this, the bows of the mighty are broken. Um, and if you have... Uh, uh, that's a prophet. That's the, the, there is also an opinion that that is a prophecy um, which is repeated in Sefer Yirmiyahu, chapter 49, verse 35. Let me see if I can find that for you. I didn't get it ready. Uh, it won't take me a sec. 49, Jeremiah 49, 35. Uh, where's Jeremiah? It'll be in here. Yirmiyahu, there we are. Slow today, this just when I want it to be fast. There we go. Chapter 49, verse 35. There we go. So, this is Yirmiyahu uh, um, speaking uh, in the uh, uh, concerning the uh, the, the, the um, enemy Elam, and this is uh, the uh, the time when Sidkiyahu was the king of Yehuda. And look at Pasuk 35. Uh, have you got it, Leon? Yes. Go ahead. Thus said Hashem, Master of Legions, Behold, I am breaking the bow of Elam, the apex of their might. And I will bring upon Elam four winds from the four corners of the heavens, and I will scatter them to all these directions. There will be no nation where the exiles of Elam will not come. Okay, so there you go. So, so this is uh, um, one of the Mepharshim uh, uh, explained that Hannah's uh, expression here, the bowels of the mighty are broken, um, which is in the uh, present tense, is referring to uh, that later prophecy. And the, uh, um, the idea of those who are satiated have hired themselves out for bread while the hungry have ceased. Uh, that's a, uh, um, uh, there's a prophecy there, which is talking about, uh, as David just mentioned, the uh, uh, destruction of Jerusalem um, uh, with, by Rome, where there was a, a, a terrible situation where the hungry, we, if you only have to read it in the, um, in the Kinot of Tisha B'Av, when you read the, the, the terrible things that went on there, that Mothers ate their own children, etc., because of the hunger. It is a terrible, terrible things that you read what went on in the time of the destruction of the uh, Second Temple. Many of the cannot refer to that. Um, and then, of course, we know that in the future, uh, the Roman Empire uh, eventually uh, was defeated and fizzled out. Um, whereas us, who were the hungry, we have ceased to be hungry, and the Kaddish Baruch has brought us back to our land. So uh, there are those who see uh, verse 5 as prophetic um, 
for the uh, even for the modern day, uh, even though it's taken uh, well, this would have been about 1200 BCE. So it's taken about 3000 years or so for this prophecy of Hannah's to be fully uh, uh, to be fully fulfilled. But this just tells us how fortunate we are to be in this era when the prophecy of Hannah, verse five, at least uh, the first half of verse five is being um, is being uh, fulfilled. Yes, Howard. Howard. In, chap in chapter 50, there are several um, similar reference, not dissimilar references, 35, 36, 37, quite a few uh, prophecies that uh, our enemies will uh, suffer. You, where, where, where are you looking, Howard? Jeremiah 50, 30, 34, 35, 36, 37, quite interesting. Yeah, it, it's well, the whole of Jeremiah is full of prophecies, usually prophecies of doom, which That's is it. why uh, 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 there's an English expression, you're a right Jeremiah, which means that you are a prophet of doom. Uh, uh, that's an, an old-fashioned an old English expression uh, to be a Jeremiah. Have I mean, any of you heard that expression? Sure. Yeah? To, to be a Jeremiah it means to, be a, to bring bad news, to be a prophet of doom. Um, um, so that was, that was Yirmiyahu's life. If you look at Yir, the life of Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah will get there eventually uh, in Tanakh. But uh, he had a terrible, miserable life because uh, he spent his whole life prophesying about doom. Uh, he wasn't accepted for it, he was thrown into prison, um, and, uh, and of course, ultimately, his prophecies came, uh, uh, came to, to fruition. Um, so, uh, let's go back to Chana, uh, verse 6, Hashem may mit umechaye, morid sho'ol v'ya'al. He brings down to the grave and raises up, uh, he kills and he makes alive. That is a, uh, an illusion that is an illusion, say the Mephorosh, also a prophecy. What might that be an illusion to in verse 6? And he offers. Is it part of the Shiva service in, in the home? Well, it is, yes. I mean, we, we do talk about this, don't we? We say it in Davening as well. Uh, God is the one that uh, gives life and takes away life. Um, but there's, there's a specific, there's a specific, um, there's a specific um, episode in Tanakh, which uh, the Mepharshim say this is alluding to. Um, and, and the Radak uh, um, is one that points this out. Any ideas? David. Yeah, there's two things. First of all, the obvious thing is uh, an allusion to Tchiat HaMeitim. Um, and from the uh, biblical allusion, uh, as uh, Gemara, which we'll get to in about 30 years in Sanhedrin, uh, saying that this was a, a prayer for uh, Korach uh, to be uh, given Olam Haba after he'd been uh, swallowed up. Okay, that's that's excellent. Let's take the first one first. If you look in the Torah, and in fact, if you look in the whole of Tanakh, you will not find any direct reference to Tchiat HaMeitim. Tchiat HaMeitim is the resurrection of the dead, um, which uh, is a fundamental uh, principle uh, of Jewish belief, according to the Rambam, at least. Um, to believe in the resurrection of the dead, whatever that means. Uh, and obviously it means different things to different people. But there is nothing in the whole of Tanakh, which, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Openly, that's not the word I'm looking for, but that'll do for the moment, uh, which openly speaks about resurrection of the dead. And there are uh, um, opinions that the uh, concept of Tchiat HaMeitim was something which was um, first postulated by the Perushim, the Pharisees, uh, in opposition to the Sadducees, the Tzadokim, who did not believe in Triata Meitim, did not believe in Olam Haba. Um, and there are others who, who say that the, the idea of this Triata Meitim was of, of resurrection of the dead, was because the people 
uh, at the time of the Perushim were, were being persecuted by the Romans and ultimately ended with the uh, destruction of the temple. It was a very, very tough time in history. Again, I refer you to the Kinot of Tisha B'Av to, uh, uh, to get an idea of how awful it was. Um, and if you like, <clears throat> the idea of Tchiat HaMeitim was a bit, of, a bit like we've spoken in the past. It was a bit what I call the Wizard of Oz syndrome. Uh, that somewhere over there, over the rainbow, there is a better future. So don't worry about this world. This world's lousy. But don't worry. There is something called the resurrection of the dead. There is Olam Haba. Uh, there's a future world uh, which is much more important and much more uh, valuable uh, than this particular world that we're in. So if you have a miserable time in this world, don't worry, you get, uh, you're going to have a much better time in Olam Haba when there is Tchiat Amitim, this whole idea of resurrection of the dead and Olam Haba, they're all sort of um, um, bound up together, although not exactly the same, there are parallels there. So the, you won't find any direct reference, that was the word I was looking for, direct, you won't find any direct reference to Olam Abba or to Tchiat Explicit reference. Explicit, thank you. I'm struggling this morning with my language. Good job you're here to help me out. Okay, there is no explicit reference to Olam Abba um, um, or to Tchiat Tim in the Tanakh. I was getting worried there, David. I thought you were going to tell me that there was and I'd missed one. Um, uh, so and there aren't anyway. So, um, uh, and that for some people is a big problem. Because they'll say, well, OK, it's all made up, like these people have said. It's just a made up thing, the Wizard of Oz syndrome. But uh, those are uh, people who uh, uh, are, are on the Rambam's page and who believe in the concept of Tchiat HaMetim, which is a fundamental uh, Jewish uh, belief, according to the Rambam, will point to uh, this Pasuk here, verse 6, uh, as uh, a an allusion, not an explicit, but an implicit uh, reference to Tchiat HaMetim, as David said, Hashem um, Meimit uh, Now, why do they say that this is a, uh, a reference to Tchiat HaMetim and not just a straightforward comment that it is God who gives life and God who, who, who takes away life? Because uh, the order is in the wrong way. If you wanted to say that uh, this Pasuk just means that it is God who uh, uh, brings life to the world uh, and God uh, takes away life from the world, and we just accept that uh, it is God that brings, uh, um, breathes the breath of life, and when after 120 years it's time to uh, go, then he takes that away, you ought to say, Hashem Mechaye, Hashem brings life, Umeimit, and then takes away life, causes death. That's the order that it happens in. You're born and you die. You don't die before you're born. Otherwise, it wouldn't make so it doesn't actually make sense the way this pasuk is. It, if you're going to read it in a uh, natural uh, manner of saying this is just talking about uh, the the entity God that bestows life and ends life in the cycle of nature. It's, it would make more sense to say Hashem mechaye u meimit, and it doesn't. It says it upside down, meimit u mechaye. And that is the uh, opening for the Mephorshim to say that this is not the exclusive source, but one of the main sources for our belief in the resurrection of the dead, whatever that means. Um, uh, uh, coming from this pasuk because it says meimit umechaye. God is the one who causes life to go away, to die umechaye, and then after that uh, he brings life. Morid um, Sha'ol, he takes one or brings one down. Sha'ol, Sha'ol is is the uh, the nether world, if you like, the depths. Uh, where do we have that word in Tanakh? Anybody know? Apart from David, anybody know where that word comes in Tanakh? It's, I'll give you a clue. It's in Sefer Bereshit. Mm. Paul? No, no, no. Okay, David, tell us where it is. Okay, 
car right. with um, uh, Yosef. Exactly. The story of Yosef. When Yosef uh, is, uh, is um, dealt with by his brothers, sent down the pits, schlepped out of the pits, sent down to Egypt. Uh, you all know the story. Yaakov gets his, uh, gets his coat uh, with blood on it and says, well, he's been torn to pieces by a wild animal. And he says, I am going to be brought down to the grave uh, in, in, uh, in an early fashion. This is going to this is going to give me an early grave. Uh, and it uses the word she'ila, uh, meaning the Shaola. depth. I'm, I'm going to be bro brought down uh, into the depth. So she'ol means the grave here. Now, it's the same idea. Morid she'ol, he brings down people to the grave, talking about Hashem now. Ve'ya'al, and then he raises them up. Well, that is about as explicit a, uh, uh, an expression about tchiat ha-meitim as you're going to get. I said before that there was no explicit mention of tchiat ha-meitim, um, and you could argue with me and say, well, actually, that's pretty explicit. This is poetry, and therefore uh, we can't accept it as uh, literal, uh, because poetry is not literal. That's the whole idea of poetry. It is using a metaphor and simile and, and etc. Uh, but uh, it's very clear uh, with the benefit of hindsight, knowing that we do have as one of our fundamental principles, uh, the, the uh, resurrection of the uh, dead, that this is uh, the source for our belief. And this again, um, really demonstrates, I'll come to you in a sec, uh, Sharon. Um, it, this really demonstrates uh, again what a major place Chana has in, in our uh, religion. Chana is a very, very important person. That's why uh, um, uh, I think it's important that we, we spend time on pre Chana's previous prayer, which we did a lot through the, the eyes of the Gemara. Uh, telling us how we should pray. And here, this is Chana, either knowingly or unknowingly, and I, I, I have no idea whether, uh, which it is, actually making really fundamental uh, prophecies, fundamental statements, uh, which we as modern day Jews uh, are, able to, uh, are able to relate to. So um, if you look at, uh, um, if you look at the, what we've said before, the bows of the mighty are broken, those who stumble are girded with strength. Let's look at our modern history. Uh, look at the Six Day War. Uh, they were mighty and we were pretty broken, to be honest. We were, if you speak to Herzl, uh, he'll tell you that they were, they were firing with broomsticks uh, in that war. Uh, and, and we all know what happened. Everything was turned on its head, and that's the prophecy of Chana for us uh, uh, then. Uh, and uh, this idea of Tchiat HaMeitim is fundamental. Uh, yes, Sharon? You're muted. Just, just a thought that uh, the Jewish day begins with the darkness of night. That similarly, uh, from nothing were we created so that, um, you know, uh, from the chaos. So I think that there's an analogy in the Jewish way of looking at things. I'm not taking anything for granted that it is the way it appears, that we think would day, day should begin in the morning, but it doesn't. And similarly, life should begin with life, but it doesn't, it starts from chaos. So it's just an analogy. Interesting analogy, yeah, I, I, it, it, very interesting analogy. Um, does anybody know historically? Um, does anybody know historically when um, the twenty-four hour clock uh, um, first came into use, and that we would talk? We talked about the idea of midnight uh, being the um, the start of a, a new date day. Does anybody know when that was? I, I have no idea, but it would be interesting to know historically when that was because we clearly, uh, as Sharon has pointed out, we have right from the beginning in the, in, in the, the Sefer Bereshit chapter one, Vayehi Erev, Vayehi Voker. First of all, there was Erev, first of all, there was nighttime, and then there was uh, morning. So our days, as Sharon has pointed out, begin uh, at night when it's dark, uh, when there's lack of clarity, uh, and only later do we get the clarity of day. 
Uh, but I'd be interested uh, if anybody uh, knows that. If not, we'll, we can look it up and talk about it next week. Uh, when historically that came into uh, uh, use of this uh, idea of midnight and midday. Um, okay, let's carry on. Johnny uh, and the Johnny and the Shmona Esra and their leader in Mechal Kelchayim, a few places it mentions Mechay and May Tim, but at the end of that paragraph it goes Mida Malach Malach May Mita Mechay. That's where it comes from. This is where it comes from. Ah, okay. The Shmona Esra comes just... takes takes that May Mita or Mechay from this pasuk. Hashem May Mita or Mechay. Exactly. The other times it's exactly the other way right. around in the Shmona Esra. The, the Sorry. Other... Three times it's mentioned the other way around before Kedusha. But at the end of the day, what does the bracha end with? Baruch Atah Hashem. Mechayi HaMeitim. Mechayi HaMeitim, who yeah. bring, brings back the dead. Yeah. Meimit yeah. Mechayi. Correct. Yes. Yes, David. Yeah, you remember I sent you uh, a Yalkut a few weeks ago, Johnny. So, yeah, I am. Uh, where he says this is the source that women should say the Amida three times a day. And he goes through with references to all of the original 18 brachot of how Hannah referred to them. And perhaps uh, when, when we get to the end of the, the, the Tempest, so if you want to go through uh, this Yalkut to show exactly where the language is, which refers to the brachot of the Amida. Okay, yeah, I, it, that's a very good idea. Perhaps we'll do that uh, because uh, the first prayer of Hannah, of course, taught us the, um, the how to prayer, to pray, that we have to pray three times a day, that we have to actually say the words, and we have to face to Jerusalem, uh, we should have a window in the room, all those things that we spoke about a few weeks ago in the shul. And uh, this part of the Hannah's prayer is used by the Mephoshim, and, and um, the Yalkut that David sent me is, is, is a great example of that. And uh, I wasn't planning to do that, but I actually think that's a very good idea. We can do that once we get to uh, and, the and end the, of the, And the really interesting thing is that, according to the Yalkut, this is the source for women da uh, davening. Well, I, 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 think, I think I want to concentrate a lot on the, on the women aspect uh, of, um, of mm -hmm. Hana um, as well. Uh, and I think that fits in with that. But I think it's a good idea. We'll go through uh, the Shimona Estra uh, with, in parallel with this prayer uh, when we've got through to the end of the Temp Sukkim in a week or two. Uh, yes, Howard? There was no concept of zero in the West until the 12th century. Okay. There's no Roman numeral that was zero. Right. So how did the Romans, how did the Romans, when did the Romans start their new day? That's how I don't know, but it's just fascinating that there was no zero till the 12th century in the West. How interesting. Okay. Astonishing. We should I actually believe, think I believe that, that, that the Romans, from reading um, Latin, I believe that the Romans saw the new day in the morning when Apollo drove his chariot of the sun out from the stables and across yes. the sky. Yeah. I believe so, that that's the case. That's a so long that, time ago. So but I'd was, like to ask one question while I'm on and then um, I'm going to mute myself again. Uh, is there a way to spend, for someone to put up Maimonides' commentary on Chaye HaMetim? Um, because I'd be really curious to see how he, with his Aristotelian mind, looked looked at that uh, in his text, if anybody has it. Um, well, we, we probably need to look in Murray Nevuchim for that in the, uh, in the Guide to the Perplexed um, um, for his Aristotle, Aristotelian uh, view on those things. Um, which um, I know this will surprise you. I don't actually have this at my fingertips. Uh, um, uh, so um, I, I'll do a little bit of research on it and then perhaps we can talk about that uh, another day because that's, it's, 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 it is interesting. I find it very interesting that Rambam, who is the uh, rationalist par excellence, has as one of his fundamentals something which is completely uh, irrational, which is Tchiat uh, uh, it, it, it does not fit in with the rest of Rambam's 
uh, philosophy. So I think that the question that you've raised there is actually a very interesting question. It's, it's something that sort of um, um, trundled around my mind for some time, um, although uh, I've never actually looked into it. It's sort of one of those things that you think about and think, oh, I wonder why that is, but I never actually get around to looking at it. So maybe that will be the spur for me to do so. Um, OK, thank you for that. So let's move on. Uh, two, uh, anybody got anything else before we move on to the next verse? Okay, verse seven, Leon. Hashem impoverishes and makes rich. He humbles and he elevates. Let's do eight together. He raises the needy from the dirt, from the trash heaps. He lifts the destitute to seat them with nobles and to endow them with a seat of honour. For Hashem's are the pillars of the earth, and upon them he set the world. Okay, so let's just look at number eight, because I think seven and eight go together. It's the idea, again, it's the idea of turning things on its head. Um, um, he, he makes the people who are rich can lose their money very quickly. People who are poor can become rich very quickly. Uh, he humbles and he exalts somebody who can be at the top of their uh, at top of the tree in whatever it is. Uh, we know we've seen that on numerous occasions in the 21st century already, how people uh, are uh, uh, brought down by uh, at various different actions. Um, they can, uh, and, and I remember my, my father, Sikhron and Livracha, one of his favorite sayings was, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Uh, and uh, and I think that's uh, a, a, a truism that we've seen very much in 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 the last 20, 30 years is that uh, there is hardly anybody who has reached the top of their uh, tree who somewhere or another uh, has not been brought down by uh, by something that's gone on uh, in the past, whether correctly or rightly or wrongly. Uh, I mean, even even. This, this, uh, what was going on? This, this, uh, whatever it was, this anti-racism thing, bringing down uh, uh, Churchill statue they want to take down, uh, and all this kind of stuff. Whoever, whoever it is that's reached uh, a, a high level can be brought down, and this is uh, what this is uh, referring to here. But I want to look at verse eight in some detail here. What does verse eight remind you of? Maybe if I was to read it in the Hebrew. It might remind you of it more than in the English, strangely enough. Let me read you the Hebrew. What does that sound familiar? Some of those words? Should do. Hallel. It's in Hallel. Hallel. It's very good. Hallel. 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 Okay. Hallel is made up. Hallel, the prayer of Hallel that we say on uh, Yom Tov and we say on uh, Chanukah and we say on Yom Atzma'ot and Yom Yerushalayim, in some places at least, uh, is a song of praise. Uh, and Chodesh. Where, what did you say, Johnny? Rosh Chodesh. And Rosh Chodesh, yes, yes, Rosh Chodesh as well. Uh, and it, what, what is it made up of? Hallel is made up of various... Uh, chapters of what? What does Tehillim, what's Tehillim made up of? Philip? Tehillim, you said it. Tehillim. Tehillim, <laughs> yes. Tehillim. And there we have on the screen for you, come on, there we go, chapter 113 of Tehillim, which will be very familiar to you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, day, Adonai, hallelujah, shame, Adonai. Yehi shame Adonai mevarach me'ata ve'dolam mi mizrach shemesh ad mevarach mevul al shame Adonai ram al kol gim Adonai al shemaim kvodo mi kadonai leinu magbil achshavet ha mashpili lirot ba shemaim mevaretz mi kime me'afar dal me'ashpot yarim evyon lo shivi im nedivim im nedive amo moshi shivi akeret habayit em abanim. Mecha, hallelujah. Those same words that we've just said in Shmuel, there's Shmuel back on the screen, verse 8. Mekin me'afardal me'ashbot yarim evyon, same words. 
Let's have a look at Tehillim and see something really interesting. Read Tehillim 113 for us, Leon, please. Mm. One, one, three. Hallelujah. Give praise, your servants of Hashem. Praise the name of Hashem. Blessed be the name of Hashem from this time and forever. From the rising of the sun to its setting, Hashem's name is praised. High above all nations is Hashem. Above the heavens is his glory. Who is like Hashem, our God, who is enthroned on high, yet deigns to look upon the heavens and the earth? He raises the needy from the dust, from the trash heaps he lifts the destitute, to seat them with nobles, with the nobles of his people. He transforms the barren wife into a glad mother of children. Hallelujah. Okay, let's look at this verse. Well, let's look. The first few verses we can see is very clear. It's, it's blessing Hashem. Uh, I'd like to point out verse three, from the rising of the sun until its setting. That's a metaphor for life. When a person is born, his sun rises. And when a person dies, his sun sets. This is a parallel to what Hannah said. Uh, it's the uh, uh, same idea. And then we have uh, verse 7, as we've said, the exact same words. Now, uh, Tehillim is uh, uh, said to have been written by whom? David HaMelech. Okay, David HaMelech. David HaMelech lived approximately uh, uh, two generations on from Chana. How do we know that? Because when we go on and we carry on learning um, Shmuel Aleph and then into Shmuel Bet, we will see that actually uh, um, Shmuel, the son of Chana, is the one who finally anoints King David as king. So they are almost contemporaneous. It's very likely uh, that Chana was still alive uh, at the time when David HaMelech was, uh, um, was anointed. So uh, it's interesting that David Amelech borrows uh, uh, the ideas for his Tehillim from uh, Tfilat Chana, his idea of Mashpili Lirot, sorry, Mimikimi me Afar Dol me Ashpot Yarim Evion, Lohoshivi im Nedivim im Nedive Amo. Now, if the Tehillim 113 was to stop at verse 8, you would not say to me, I don't think, hang on a minute, this isn't right, there's something missing, he stopped in the middle. Look at verse 9, it doesn't seem to fit with the rest of Tehillim, verse, uh, chapter 113. He seats the barren woman of the house as a happy mother of children. What is the connection between that and what's gone on before? It doesn't seem, it seems a bit incongruous to me. Um, it, and I've always wondered about this, uh, about this Tehillim. Why is that last pass up there? It doesn't seem to fit. But now, when we see that uh, David Amelech has borrowed uh, verses 7 and 8 from Tfilat Chana, then of course verse 9 makes perfect sense. Because verse 9 is referring to the authoress of the prayer that he has taken verses seven and eight from. Verse nine refers to Hannah herself. He seeks the barren woman of the house as a happy mother of children. That's what this whole Tfilat Hannah is about on the surface. It's about Hannah giving thanks to HaKadosh Baruch Hu for having uh, the opportunity to have Shmuel as a child. So uh, it, when you understand where David HaMelech has taken seven and eight from, Verse 9 fits in perfectly. Without knowing that, if you just look at chapter 113, verse 9 seems to stick out because what we're looking at in, in, in the rest of the verses is a much grander scheme. It's a bit like what Paul said uh, uh, earlier on 
um, which is that, you know, it's a bit of hyperbole going on here. Well, here we've got the opposite way around. In Tehillim 113, the first eight verses are, are, are of great, wonderful, uh, big national sort of uh, things. And verse nine is a bit parochial. Um, and yet they go together. Uh, and I think it's very clear uh, when you look at the uh, when you look at the two uh, um, the two chapters, the chapter of one one three of Tehillim, and our Tfilat Chana in chapter two of Shmuel Aleph, and you put them side by side, you can see very clearly where that has come from. And I think that's a really interesting uh, idea that David Amelech has incorporated Chana's happiness uh, as part of his praise. Uh, uh, of HaKadosh Baruch Hu in his Tehillim. Uh, and, and again, I think it's, in, it, it's vital to know the uh, historical context that uh, Shmuel, the son of Chana, uh, was the one who anointed uh, David HaMelech as king. So uh, I think that's uh, something which was uh, really uh, an interesting idea to come from verse 8 here in Tefillat Chana. Any comments on that before we move on to the next little bit? Okay. Let's... Well, yeah, Johnny, conversely, I'd have thought that that pasuk for Tehillim would have fitted in perfectly to Hannah's song. It's therefore surprising that it's not incorporated there. Because that's yeah, really think... the whole thing. Well, I think you could say that she's, she's, um, she's alluded to that in verse five, hasn't she? When yeah, but this says, is really explicit. I it mean, is it, explicit, it, it, and maybe... As you said, it, it's, it's a very, very strong connection. Maybe, David, um, uh, Hannah was uh, too, um, too humble to uh, want to actually be so explicit as to uh, uh, suggest that uh, little Hannah, unimportant Hannah, is of the same level... Uh, as all those things. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, I, yeah, I, yeah, but, but, but again, as, as the Mephoshim point, points out, that she's also referring to other famous barren women in Jewish history, in, in, uh, in say, Febrachit and uh, elsewhere. Yes, yes, she does. Uh, and, and, uh, and it's clear there, because she, she talks about Akara Yalada in verse 5. Um, so you're right that it would, uh, the, the chapter, uh, chapter 113, verse 9, would certainly fit in, um, and it's very interesting that David Amelech puts it in there uh, uh, in his Tehillim. Um, let's have a look now at the last two uh, sukim of the uh, uh, song, um, and let's see what, what we can see out of that. Verses 9 and 10, Leon, please. He guards the steps of his devout ones, but the wicked are stilled in darkness. For not through strength does man prevail. Hashem, may those that contend with him be shattered. In, let the heavens thunder against them. May Hashem judge to the ends of the earth. May he give power to his king and raise the pride of his anointed one. Okay, now I'm going to take you um, to my favourite book. You know which, what my favourite book is. Where is it? There it is. Zachariah. Uh, and I'm going to take you to chapter 4, verse 6. If this will, there we go. Chapter 4 of Zachariah. Come on. There we go. Verse 6. Okay. A, uh, a, a famous pasuk. Um, let's just uh, um, have a look. Let's just get, first of all, just... Think about where what we've just said here. Um, verse nine: the, the feet of his pious ones, he will guard. The wicked shall be cut off in darkness. Ki lo bakoach yigbar ish. Not for strength will man prevail. And again, the Mephorshim pick up on this and say that this is a an allusion to the prophet uh, Zechariah. Uh, and there is the 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 verse six. If you've got it yet. To Leon? Yes, yes. Go on, off you go. He spoke up and said to me, saying, This is the word of Hashem to Zerubbabel, saying, 
not through army and not through strength, but through my spirit, said Hashem, Master of Legions. Okay, Lova Chayel, Velova Choach, Ki Im Baruchi Amar Adonai Tavot, a very, very famous Pasuk. Um, um, I'm not going to sing it to you because I'm not a very good singer, but there is a, 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 a really a beautiful song uh, to that, to those words. Uh, um, not by military force and not by phys physical strength, but by, my, but, this, but by my spirit, says Hashem of, of God. This is uh, the uh, uh, prophecy of uh, Hashem to Zerubbabel, saying, this is, you know, you think that you're going to, your strength and your military strength, uh, this, it's me, I, I'm in charge here. That's what this pasuk is saying. Um, Zerubbabel uh, um, uh, was, uh, of, of course, the uh, uh, antagonist uh, at the time, uh, uh, and uh, Zechariah, in, in, in this uh, prophecy here from the angel, is saying to Zerubbabel, uh, don't be so cocky with your own strength. Uh, uh, and if we go back to Tfilat uh, Chana, uh, where are we? Verse, uh, here we go, verse 9. The idea that not by strength man will prevail, the Mephoshim there uh, points us to uh, Zechariah, uh, that this is another uh, prophecy of Chana. And you can see how, how, how deep the Mephoshim are, 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 are mining uh, the Tfilah of Chana because they, they give it such huge importance that they uh, elevate it to the, the highest possible level, which is that of uh, prophecy. Um, and um, so that's uh, the, the uh, idea of uh, 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 the strength um, being uh, Akolish Borchus and not that of um, not, not that of man. Now, verse 10, and we're just going to finish on verse 10 today. Uh, because uh, there is something to be said about this verse. So let's have a look at verse 10 again, please, Leon. Hashem, may those that contend with him be shattered. Let the heavens thunder against them. May Hashem judge to the ends of the earth. May he give power to his king and raise the pride of his anointed one. Right, now we've got a creative here. Remember, we spoke about that last week where you read it differently to the way it's written. Um, and it says, Hashem yechatu merivav. That's how we, uh, um, that's how we pronounce, that's how we read it. Merivav means those who, uh, um, who quarrel with him. Those who, uh, it's the same word as feribul. Yeah, riv. Riv means a, an argument. So merivav is the ones who uh, argue with Hashem. It's actually written in the singular, merivo, uh, um, and uh, uh, there are a number of different um, suggestions as to what the difference is. What does it make, difference does it make whether uh, this is in the plural or the singular? Uh, and one of them is that uh, there's a suggestion that uh, in the singular, how it's written, Chana is actually um, talking about her own son, um, he said, she said about Shmuel um, that uh, Hannah's praying for the protection of her son or maybe for a future king, particularly uh, David HaMelech, um, uh, or whether this is a general idea if it's in the plural. We read it in the plural, uh, meaning that we put it into the category of Hannah's uh, um, prophecy and uh, poetry about God in general, because that fits in more uh, with the idea of this whole prayer, which, as we said before, is not just about Hannah and her own parochial small life. And then we get to the last uh, part of this Pasuk, uh, which the Christians have uh, jumped upon and used uh, um, to uh, support their uh, um, ideas. Vayarem uh, Keren Mishichon. And he raises the horn of his anointed one. Mashiach, the word Mashiach, we want Mashiach now. The word Mashiach, it means the anointed one. Uh, that's where the word Messiah 
comes from Messiah is just an uh, English, uh, well, it's not a transliteration, but it's, it's an, the anglicized vers, version of Mashiach. Um, um, l- 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 the, the word is to anoint uh, Mashiach, the one who is anointed. Now, who was anointed? Um, in the Torah, we see that the Kohen Gadol was anointed. Uh, he was the Mishich. There was also another Kohen, as well as the Kohen Gadol, who was the Kohen HaMashiach. And who, does anybody know what the Kohen HaMashiach, who is referred to in the Torah, is? He has a specific role, this Kohen HaMashiach. Yes, David? Wasn't that the one that went out to war? Yes, he was. He had a specific job. This was the Kohen who was anointed, Kohen HaMashiach. He was the anointed one who was given the job of going out to war uh, in front of all the Bnei Israel, sort of, you know, leading the battle, as it were, uh, from the spiritual point of view. He was a special Kohen who was given that special job. And that was his task. That was all he did was to uh, be the Kohen who led the war effort. And he was known as the Kohen HaMashiach because he was anointed for that particular role. So anointing is the idea of appointing a particular to a particular role. We have it in the, in the, in the, in, in the UK uh, when uh, I wasn't around, but some of you might remember the coronation in 1953. Anybody remember the coronation in 1953? Yes, Marcel, yeah. Well, you'll remember that the Queen got something poured on her head. I know that because I've seen it in the crown. Uh, But uh, (laughs) I'm assuming it was accurate. Uh, And the the Archbishop of Canterbury Canterbury actually anoints the Queen, and that's how she's crowned. She's got a little bit of oil stuck on her head. Uh, And and so uh, this is the Mashiach, the idea of Mashiach. So the, the word Mashiach, Messiah, um, is, uh, is coming from this idea. And of course, uh, the Christians believe that uh, Jesus was the Messiah. Uh, and this, they believe that this Pasuk, by Yaram Keren Mishichon, raises the horn of his anointed one, is referring to uh, uh, Jesus. Um, of course, we don't uh, accept that. And what we say this, uh, um, this prophecy of Hannah is, is the fact that she's now prophesying that her own son, Shmuel, will be the one who raises the horn. He's the one that will, he's the Archbishop of Canterbury, La Havdil, uh, uh, because he's the one that anointed the very first king of Israel, Shaul HaMelech, and he is also the one um, who uh, was uh, um, uh, the vehicle through which Shaul's um, kingship was removed, and he then anointed um, David HaMelech. By the time it came to David's son, Shlomo, Shmuel was no longer around, and it would have been Natan uh, Hanavi who, who, did the, uh, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury at, at that time. Yes, Leon? I, I have a, a query. Um, the first line of the, of the last verse... Hashem, may those that contend with him be shattered. In the art scroll, the word him is with a small h. Could it not be read as, may those that contend with Hashem be shattered? Why why should they put a small h there? Have a look uh, on the screen, Leon. Verse 10. Exactly what you say. Those who strive with the Lord will be broken. So they, they, are, they have translated it exactly as you are asking it for it to be translated. Um, and the art scroll have put a comma after the word Hashem. And that is why uh, um, there is this creative. Because if you have it in the singular, right... You have it in the singular, Hashem, Yechatu Merivo, as it's written, then you need your comma, because it means Hashem, those who strive with him, small h, referring to Shmuel, her son, may they be broken. This, uh, in the art scroll translation, is a prayer of Hannah 
for her son. In the Chabad translation here, as you have pointed out, Leon, it is uh, they're taking the uh, the way it's read, not the way it's written, and it's in plural, and therefore it means anybody who is striving with Hashem should be broken. So it's a very uh, 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 interesting point that the uh, art scroll translation uh, goes along with the written uh, uh, um, word, and our translation on the screen goes with the red, R-E-A-D, word. Very interesting. Yes, Dave? Right. What, who was the first time putting oil on someone's head was used, and why did they think it was the right thing to do? Uh, uh, the first, the first, um, the first mention of it in the Torah is with the coin. With uh, the the coin should be anointed. Co Aaron Hakohen was anointed um, with the oil of Kahuna, of priesthood. It was a sign of uh, uh, of being appointed to a high office. Whether there are any more ancient uh, um, texts than the Torah, which. Uh, mentions it, I don't know. I'm not suggesting that that was the first time in history it was ever done. It may well have been a recognized method of anointing uh, the leader, uh, the king, the priest, whatever it was from before that. But in the Torah, uh, it's mentioned uh, in the written Torah, it's mentioned with regard to the priesthood. Uh, that, as far as I'm aware, is the first time it's mentioned in the Torah. Uh, unless well, David Marx is going to correct me. No, 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 you're right. But, but there's an illusion earlier as well with Yaakov pouring oil over the stones. Ah, oh, OK. Yes, yes, that's true. Yaakov pours, oils o uh, pours oil over the Matseva, um, which is, I suppose, that's consecrating it, I suppose, in a way, uh, uh, anointing uh, a person to a, a position of office is consecrating that person into office. So yes, I suppose you could uh, you could you could um, uh, bring that as an earlier one. I think the first one, as far as people flow in the Torah, is the Kahuna, the priesthood. Anybody who knows any earlier uh, literature than the Torah which mentions that, that would be interesting to know. Uh, Howard, do you know anyone uh, earlier than that, or you're going to make tell us something different? Different point. Okay, make a different point then. Now, just uh, the primary meaning of. Um exalt the horn of the anointed must be the metaphysical one that his uh, horn will be heard it'll be uh, exalted and be louder and trumpet uh, the arrival and the progress of the king yes the the, the horn will be, be raised and the banner be, uh, also nes the banner is also raised the nes we say and and the the banner will be raised i also saw another by the way i also saw another explanation about this raising the horn, uh, which comes from the animal kingdom. Uh, apparently, when uh, animals fight, uh, you may you know, remember if you've ever seen the Lion King, uh, um, the, and when animals fight and they lock horns, or uh, if it's deer, they lock antlers, uh, once they've won the battle, they raise their head uh, in victory and they raise their horns. And that is a, a, a demonstration in the animal world of, uh, of a victory. And so I think there's this, there is that, that metaphor as well, uh, raising the horn, as Howard said, of blowing one's own trumpet. That's what we say, don't we? You blow your own trumpet if you're saying how, how good you are. Um, so raising the horn uh, in, in the horn, as, as in a trumpet, um, and the animal kingdom raising the horn uh, uh, after victory uh, also uh, fits in. So um, the, the anointing, uh, to answer Dave's question, it's an ancient, definitely an ancient uh, um, ceremony of anointing uh, somebody into office. Uh, the equivalent, I suppose, today uh, in most offices will be swearing uh, the oath. Uh, but this is this is the 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 idea. Now, the Christians have taken this to mean uh, the uh, the Mishicho, his anointed one, being his one who is appointed, the one who is going to be. Uh, the Moshia, uh, the word Yeshu, uh, Jesus, the Hebrew word for Jesus is Yeshu, which comes from the word Yoshia to, uh, to save. The Savior, uh, they call, they, they are saying that that is Meshicho. And if you look uh, on, if you put in, uh, as I did when I was researching the Shia, or if you look, put into Google Hannah's prayer, 
um, without uh, putting in any particular mephorashim, you will get pages and pages and pages of Christian commentary on Tvilat Chana. They, uh, it's a very important prayer uh, in the Christian uh, um, world, uh, largely because of verse 10, largely because of the last few words of verse 10 that we have said. What was okay. the... In was the anointing of a few drops of oil, or was it actually pouring oil on their head? Um, I, I, I don't know, Nachum. I, I suspect it was pouring oil on their head. Um, well, that's a mess. You know, if you take oil, if you take olive oil and you pour it on your head, you, you're causing a lot of problems because you, you can't get that off. I mean, that's going to be, that's going to require a major... No, it's true. You're it's right. true. I mean, we, this is a terrible thing to do. Put oil on somebody's head. You, you well, can't maybe, get it off. Maybe, we got it all over the beach. The light we got it all over the beach. Maybe it came with a bottle of shampoo. I don't know. Uh, but Well, that would have to be. How could a person walk around in ancient times with their, their head full of, full of oil? It's that crazy. Can I give you a job? Why don't you write to Buckingham Palace and ask the Queen uh, how she got the oil out of her hair after she was there? <laughs> Did they put oil in her head? Did they put oil in her head? I don't know. On her head? Nachum, Nachum, get a startup going to, to, to get oil out of the heads of crowded people. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's, uh, let's say hello to everyone, like my honey. Uh, right, we will wish you a Shavua Tov. Uh, next week, we will get back to a bit of history because we will move on, interestingly, uh, to the uh, story of the sons of Ailey. Ailey, of course, was the uh, Kohen Gadol who we met earlier on in this story of Chana. And we, see a, we will see a huge contrast between the son of uh, Chana, Shmuel, um, and the sons of Ailey. Uh, um, who were uh, uh, not quite on the same uh, um, same madrega, the same high level as you will see, please God, next week. So until then, I shall wish you a Shavuot Tov. Shavuot Tov. Shavuot Tov. Thank you, Tony. Shavuot Tov, everybody. Shavuot -tov. Shavuot -tov.